Bible tonight, turn over to the book of 2 Kings. You'll find your place there in 2 Kings and go to chapter 2. Certainly has been a busy weekend and a, a blessed weekend. We've had a number of just exciting things and just a good time of fellowship, but a lot to do in a short amount of time. So I do appreciate the participation in the ladies' conference, a number of, uh, of course, outside folks came in for that, and we appreciate uh, even some local churches that sent uh, uh, groups to come over and be part of that, and uh, just went really well, and I believe it was a help and encouragement, and of course this morning in the service, uh, even in our Sunday school time, we enjoyed that, so just a lot to, lot to take in, and certainly a good time of uh, fellowship and help and encouragement, so we want to take time tonight, spend a few moments in God's Word, so if you'll find your place in 2 Kings in chapter 2, I'm going to read there a text in a moment, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you tonight that we can be here in our service and fellowship and read your word and be instructed by it. Lord, we know there's much that we'll face this week, opportunities to be a witness. Perhaps you know, there'll be trials, difficulties. Lord, we don't know what is in front of us. Perhaps this is the week when you'll come to take us to be with you. But Lord, we would just trust that what you do tonight would encourage us and help us and prepare us and strengthen us for what we would face in the days to come. We pray the Lord Jesus would be lifted up, that we might be drawn closer to you, and we thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2 Kings in chapter 2, and this is a familiar passage, especially in the midst of a book like 2 Kings, but if you'll notice down in verse 9, it says, It came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he says, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me, when I'm taken up from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, they behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, this account in the Bible is unique in that there are really only two places where a person escaped the gate of death and went to heaven. Of course, Enoch, we know, was not, and God took him. Here, Elijah literally goes up to heaven in a whirlwind of fire. Perhaps you ask the question, you say, well, do you really believe that Elijah uh, went up in that literal, or was this figure, was it exaggerated? Was this uh, just something that the writers put down and maybe uh, just a story that was passed down from generation to generation? Listen, I believe Elijah went up in a whirlwind of fire as much as I believe I'm standing on this platform tonight. I believe what's written in this book is true, and you say, well, don't you think some folks are going to question that? Hey, even in this chapter, there are people that question as to what God really did. Now, I'm not tonight talking about the group necessarily not going to spend a lot of time that would question a miracle in the Bible. But I do look at this chapter and I see that certainly Elisha wasn't surprised. He knew what God was going to do. And yet there were some folks who uh, weren't sure exactly if God had done what he promised he would do. And then, of course, outright uh, deniers of what took place. Human nature really has not changed. Now, what my question is tonight is how do we respond to the supernatural? See, I believe God still does supernatural things. I'm not saying that I'm tonight looking for the paranormal. The world is enamored by that. I mean, if you talk about a ghost or a spirit or a haunted house or something uh, paranormal, there's a bunch of folks that jump on that immediately and think, boy, that's, uh, that's exciting, that's sensational. And even to the point of they'll talk about it, bring it up, they might have a whole documentary on it trying to convince you that something that's not necessarily what we see every day, that's paranormal. But when I bring up the supernatural, oh, that's just backwoods, old-fashioned, mythological, who would ever believe that? Well, I believe God is still able to do supernatural things. God has always worked supernaturally. In fact, every time a soul comes to Jesus, that is a supernatural act of God. I mean, we take it for granted because it happens. God made it so easy. You know, it's kind of like when they have if you ever noticed, and I haven't noticed this recently, but I've seen it numerous times in a football game, 
Nobody's got that on their mind, do they? Okay. Now, a football game, they'll have John 3.16 down at the end zone. You ever seen that? Don't do it as much anymore. What was the point? The point is, this is easy. I mean, you come on, we got this a gimme. That's the encouragement, John 3.16, because salvation, they're saying, God's done everything. All you got to do is receive it. That's the point they're making with their sign. Do you know salvation has been made so easy by God, so simple, that even a child can understand that if we're not careful, we might take for granted how supernatural it is for a soul to be saved. So let me tell you two theological truths that seem to contradict, but they don't. The fact is, a sinner cannot go to heaven. That's one theological truth. The other theological truth is, sinners are going to go to heaven. Now that, that seems to be contradictory, doesn't it? It's impossible for a sinner to go to heaven. God's holy. He's so pure. Uh, no, nothing that shall enter in shall defile. The other theological truth is, Every single human being that walks this earth is a sinner, and they cannot go to heaven. It's an impossibility. There's no way God would ever allow sin into his presence, and yet sinners are going to go to heaven. You know why? Supernatural. God supernaturally, miraculously, no explaining on the human understanding, makes a sinner a saint by the death, resurrection, and the work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So just in that one element, we see it so much, we might take it for granted. That is a supernatural thing. But I believe God still works in supernatural ways. Now, God often uses natural means to bring around his purpose. You know, I could ask uh, prayer. We were recently praying for a, uh, a person who we heard has had cancer in the past, and it had come back. My wife and I heard about this, and we uh, prayed about it ourselves, and we just found out the person went to the doctor, and the doctor said, turned out, it's not cancer. Now, you could look at that and say, well, boy, I guess we didn't need to be so uptight after all. I mean, we really wanted to pray, and we were burdened, but if we'd have known it wasn't cancer, I guess we didn't really, wasn't that big a deal. No, the, I look at that as God answered prayer. It doesn't have to be that the doctor came in, laid hands on it, and the thing changed. He might have just found out, oh, I guess we were mistaken. I can't tell you numerous times people have gone to a doctor and got a report that you're, it's dire. Christians have prayed. They go back, and the doctor just views it like, oh, we, we made a mistake. Well, no, you probably didn't. God did something. Now, I'm not necessarily classifying that in what we call supernatural. God has used perhaps a natural means, unexplainable. In a sense, it is supernatural because if he takes away a disease that would have killed you, but you can't necessarily prove it. Now, there have been supernatural instances. There's been times where the doctor says, I don't know why. When I looked at it two months ago, there's cancer. I looked at it now and there's not. Well, that's supernatural. Medicine can't do it. They can't explain it. It happens. So physically it happens. Spiritually it happens. But yes, God still does the supernatural. But you know, in the society in which we live, we're, we're influenced by as believers so much so-called education, so much so-called emphasis on scientific knowledge. Um, we've got so much uh, technology, so many advancements, so many things that we just can't imagine how they've taken place. If we're not careful, we relay that into the spiritual, so we're very apprehensive about getting excited about what God does in the supernatural. Hey, God uh, ignores, in a sense, looks over, looks past, isn't a bit taken back by the little stuff man seems to come up with. So when we see the supernatural work of God, or at least anticipate it, how are we going to respond? Well, I think we got a good incident in here. Because one of the most supernatural things you'll see in the Old Testament is Elijah taking up by a whirlwind of fire. He's walking along, God comes down, swoops him up, and they watch him go, and he's taken up into heaven. Now, only a, we know Elisha saw it. We know there were some other folks that were nearby that knew something took place. And evidently, before it happened, God already put the word out there that it was going to take place. And yet, even after it took place, when the word spread, there were people that wondered if God really did it. You know, when I look at this, I see, first of all, you've got some folks, and we'd expect this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. But you've got this first group I'll call the ignorant. I mean, they just blatantly look at what God did, can't explain it, but they still deny it. Now, look down after this takes place. In verse 23, Elisha now, 
went up. It says, he went up thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and terror, forty and two children of them. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel, and from thence he returned Samaria. Now there have been uh, linguists who have made a point here of understanding the word little children, because it is a unique word. God made a point of saying these were little children. The emphasis is probably not talking about, uh, you know, Rhett coming up and, and saying this. It's probably teenagers. Um, they're not men yet. They're not grown. They weren't little kids, but probably a group of teenagers, about like today. And what were they saying? They were saying, Elisha, we know you followed Elijah. We've heard the word. We know people are claiming he went up in a whirlwind of fire. Come on. We don't believe that. Why don't you go up, bald head? You look just like him. Show us how to do it. It was mockery. Now, Elisha simply turned around, and he says he cursed them in the name of the Lord. He didn't curse Adam. He simply, as a prophet of God, stated the truth to them. You are cursed, and they were. And God, when God wanted to back up the prophet, he didn't have any problem doing it. He wasn't, Elisha didn't create the curse, he just recognized it. He recognized, you people have missed the work of God. Certainly, I'm not worried about you. I'm not concerned what you think about it. You say, well, I just don't know for God to send out she-bears and take out those teenagers. I just don't believe that was right. Take it up with him when you meet him. God's never made his first mistake. You've got people here that remind us, just like in our society today, that are just brazenly ignorant about what God is doing. I mean, I talked about this morning, and I'm not going to rehash it, I don't think, uh, about the Bible. I mean, they look at a, a book that they cannot explain. They can't put their finger on it. They can't find an error in it. They can't find a discrepancy. They'll try to claim there's one, but no provable error. They can't explain why this book's still around, why it still exists, how it has so much influence. They just can't put their finger on it, but they brazenly deny, well, there's really just nothing to it. Well, that's ignorant. And they are cursed people, and yet Jesus came, and he took our curse upon himself. They could still trust him. They could still be saved, but they are ignorant. Some people see the supernatural work of God, and they come up with any other explanation they can come up with besides God did it. I, I, I think about the evolutionary uh, teaching. Now, people often mistake natural selection with evolution. They use the term interchangeably. But we talk about evolution to think that we came from lower developments of life and so forth, that a, a, you know, a monkey ended up becoming a man, or to even say the origin that we have is, uh, is a, uh, the Big Bang and so forth. You know, no matter what you do with your origin, just to show you how ridiculous their position is, You've got to admit, if you're a thinking person and you're logical and you just say, well, I'm not even approaching it as a Bible believer, logically, something or someone had to be around forever. Something had to have no beginning. Now, your brain can't comprehend no beginning, nor can mine, but logically, there's no other explanation. Because all we'd have to do is keep saying, where did that come from? Where did that come from? At some point, the start can't start. It had to always be. So you've got a choice. Either an inanimate, powerless blob of something who knows existed forever, which would make it self-existent, or an all-powerful, omnipotent, powerful, self-existent God who can do anything has been around forever. If you approach that totally on a neutral platform, which one makes the most sense? Even if I didn't have revelation, I'd come to the conclusion some person who's much more powerful than I, he had to have a personality to give me one. How are you going to spontaneously generate a personality? If, he, if I've got one, he had to have one. I can breathe. I can think. I'm conscious. Somebody greater than I had to do that. So again, look at the position of the person who looks at that, just the supernatural of my existence. And they say, you got to come up with another explanation. But, you know, I don't believe tonight we have a bunch of people, probably, if, if anybody, it'd be very few, 
who take this position of the ignorant when it comes to the supernatural. But then there's a second group here that I'm going to call the indifferent. Now, notice the process here. You got Elisha over in verse 2. Um, in fact, read back in verse 1. It says, It came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, the story is out, and obviously by the time 2 Kings is written, most anybody that's reading 2 Kings knows this was common knowledge. This is the first time it's mentioned in the Bible, chapter 2, verse 1, but it's written as if, well, obviously anybody reading this has heard of this. This is the time when it happened, and that's how it introduces. So Elijah says unto Elisha, Terry, he, I pray thee, the Lord had sent me to Bethel. In verse 3, the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. They viewed it as something bad's going to happen today. You know this is the day. Now, God had undoubtedly revealed this somehow, and these were the sons of the prophets. These were the, the, the preacher boys. These were folks that were being trained. They had had gifts and abilities and sensed a call, and men of God were trying to train them to share the word of God. And they were the sons of the prophets, but they came with sort of a, something bad's going to happen today. You know, this is going to be a negative thing. This isn't going to go well. Elisha says, I'm familiar with this, and I'm not worried about it if God's behind it. That's basically what he said. Well, finally, they get uh, taken out. Uh, Elisha, you know, just are anticipating this, and these men know about it. So the sons of the prophets, again in verse 7, 50 men of the sons of the prophet went and stood to view afar off. They wouldn't even come close. They wanted to watch it off in the distance. You know, they wanted to leave themselves a little out. They didn't want to be too close when it happened because what if it doesn't go well? What if this doesn't happen just like we've been claiming that it's going to happen? I mean, the word's out. He's going to be taken up. But what if all he happens is he just, a rock falls on him and kills him? What if he just ducks into a cave and hides? What are we going to look like fools? Do you know when you do something for God, you basically take a step and say, you know what, if God doesn't do it, I'd look like a fool. But I just don't believe that God is not going to do what he said he's going to do. There's risk in following the Lord. Now, in essence, there's really not a risk. But there is risk from a human standpoint when you follow the Lord. That's what faith is, isn't it? You take a step of faith. Now, I can't necessarily take blind faith. I can't necessarily go to some place or do some act or uh, do something bold just because I come up with it and say, well, God has to do this. No, God never has to do anything except follow the promise of his book. But on the other hand, if God has promised me something and the Spirit of God gets a hold of my heart and says, this is what God has, there have been plenty of folks head off to a mission field and even their preacher and their parents are scratching their head and saying, are you sure God called you to do this? But they're sure. There's risk in this. There's risk, but they knew God called them. There's been other folks who've been called to preach, and, I mean, they just didn't have any evident gifts, but they sense God's call, and people have wondered, are you really sure this is what God... And there have been folks who, their mama called them, it didn't work out, I get that, but God really called the person, and you look later and say, isn't that something? I didn't really trust the Lord, but boy, they did. It takes risk to step out and do what God wants you to do. Well, these people wanted to watch afar off. They wanted to give themselves at least enough distance to say, well, if it does happen, I was watching. But if it goes bad, well, you see, I wasn't really in that anyway. That's the indifferent crowd, isn't it? That's the picture of a believer who knows that the possibility, the potential exists. It might be that God would do something, but he probably won't. You know, there's people like that today. I can't say that I hadn't had times in my life when I was cold and indifferent and thought to myself, God could, but probably won't but we ought not be in that position. You know, I looked after it took place even. I mean, now he's been taken up in a whirlwind of fire, full-fledged taking place. It's happened. They've watched afar off. They looked at it. But then you read over here, if you would, in, the, uh, in verse uh, 16. They said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. Lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley, and he said, you shall not send. Elisha said, no, we're not going to go check out to see if God did what he said he was going to do. 
Well, they urged him till he was ashamed. And he said, and I don't think he was ashamed of himself. He was ashamed of them. They kept begging. He basically said, all right, go check it. I already know the result. Go ahead. Send. And they sought 50 men, and they sought three days, but found him not. And they came again to him. And he said, did not I say unto you, go not? That's the King James way of saying, I told you so. I mean, there wasn't any need to know. Even after that, I just can't believe God would have done that. You know, a revival could break out, and I understand people can be uh, misguided uh, in their theology, what they equate with a revival. It was nothing but an emotional stir, and so I understand that's happened before, but a, a good moving of God could take place in a church, and I've heard people immediately jump on it. They criticize. I mean, a good Bible-preaching church, and they want to criticize it. Oh, well, God, you know, I just don't believe God would do that kind of thing today. Well, why not? He did it in the book of Acts. Why wouldn't he work today? You know, people, if you're not careful, uh, and I've, I've traveled a lot and I've been with a lot of uh, preachers, and some preachers have a martyr's complex. Now, what I mean by that is, in fact, somebody said preachers, some preachers will make good martyrs. They're so dry, they burn well. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, they look and they say, you know, God's not doing much in my church. And I haven't seen souls saved. We haven't really seen... A significant answer to prayer. They don't necessarily state it this way, but that's what they've observed. We haven't really seen a significant answer to prayer. Uh, the Spirit's not great. Uh, not many people saved, and it's just kind of dying on the vine. And they stop and they say, but you know, I think that's just the way it is today. That's a martyr's complex. You know, it, it's because I take such a good stand. It's because I preach so hard. It's because I, you know, stand so much against the culture. I had a preacher friend who was going into evangelism years ago, and a preacher came to his church to do a meeting. He was an older guy. Um, I suppose at that time he was, you know, seemed like he was 110. He was probably 60, but he seemed old to me. But he told this younger fellow, he gave him some advice. He said, hey, I'm actually, you know, graduated. I've started trying to get some meetings. I'm going into evangelism. He said, well, I'll go ahead and tell you. He said, if you take a good stand today, you're not going to get many meetings. And you preach the word and stand straight, you, you're not going to, you know, hardly anybody's going to have you in. And he told me that. And, of course, I was going into evangelism, too. And I thought, what kind of advice is that to a young man who's going into evangelism? It didn't discourage me at all, but I thought, just because that's his experience doesn't mean that's going to be this young man's experience. That's a martyr's complex. I mean to say, well, yeah, they took Elijah up, but they, I just believe God probably took him up and dropped him in the mountain somewhere. I mean, he couldn't have, that just, I've never seen God do that before. That's nowhere else in the Bible. I just, I mean, I just can't believe God would really do something like that. Look, maybe God hadn't done like anything like that for me, but I believe God can do anything. Is anything too hard for him? Now, he's not going to violate his word. I'm not going to change my theology off of something that I hear about or see, but based on this book, I've got great latitude for God to do some wonderful things. I mean, God can still work. He can still save. He can still change people's lives. He can still turn people around. I mean, God can do wonderful things. So you've got the ignorant. You've got the indifferent. But then, let's say to the positive, you've got the empowered. You've got Elisha. Elisha was looking for God to do something. Now, I look back in this chapter, and I notice, first of all, there's a progression it starts, and I'm glad there's a progression because I need to progress. I can't, may not be where he's at, but I know how to get, he can show me how to get there. First of all, Elijah says in verse 2 unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Then you go down to verse 4, and Elijah said to Elisha, same thing. Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went to Jericho. Verse 6, Elijah said unto Elisha in verse 6, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. Same answer. I'm not, no, I'm, not, I'm sticking with you. Then if you'll notice uh, what Elijah said in our text in verse 9, it came to pass when they were gone over that Elisha said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do thee before I be taken away. And, of course, he gives the request. And he says unto them in verse 10, he says, If thou see me when I'm taken from thee, it shall be so. 
Now, what was going to be the condition of him seeing a double portion of his spirit be put on him? He had to be with him and see him when he got taken up. Now, somehow or another, Elisha perceived that that's where the power was. He perceived that's where the blessing was, was with Elisha. He wasn't going to leave. He said, man, God's about to do something. You think I'm going to leave? Then why did Elisha tell him to? Elisha, I mean Elijah rather, told Elisha, tarry here. He didn't say get away from me. He said, you stay here. I got bigger business to go. He basically gave him permission to stay where he was. And you know, God may give you permission to stay where you are. But if you want to see God do something, he's testing you. He wants you to take another step. It's easy to become satisfied. It's easy to feel like I'm okay right where I am. And God might say, okay, stay right where you are. But if you want to do something for the Lord, he will let you progress. You can move forward in your life if you want to. Now, there's four places that I see him go. And the first place he went was Bethel. Um, actually, the first place, yeah, in, in verse 2, he went to Bethel. And I'm sorry, in verse 1, he went to Gilgal. It says that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So that's where they started. Then they went to Bethel. You know, when he took him to Gilgal, I remember Gilgal is where the reproach of Egypt was wiped away. When they first got into the land of Canaan, there was a rolling that took place. They rolled away the reproach of Egypt. Now, if you're going to begin on your progression with the Lord, you know Egypt's a picture of the world. The first thing God's going to do is say, okay, let's get serious about this thing and love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. To be not conformed to this world, but to be ye transformed. I mean, that's ground level. He said, Elisha, first thing we've got to do is remind ourselves, if we want to walk with a holy God, he wants purity in our life. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but some also of gold and silver, some made of wood and earth. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. He's looking for a pure vessel. He starts him out in a place to roll away to remind him of purity in his life. Then, as I said, they go to Bethel. You know, Bethel is the house of God. That's where Jacob, for the first time, saw the angels descending, and it was a special place up until it was turned to a place of idolatry. It was a special place in a, in a physical area where they said that's where Jacob met God face to face. I mean, he saw him as all saw the angels coming up and down. It reminds us of a place of worship and walking with God. When you begin to progress, there's more to it than just saying, I don't want to be worldly anymore. It's an idea of fellowshipping with God and getting closer to him. Well, he stayed with Elijah, moved on down, and they went to Jericho. When he went on down to Jericho in verse 4, you know what Jericho reminds us of? That was the first battle in the land of Canaan. That was a battle beat, uh, won completely by walking around faith. God did it all by his power. I think Jericho reminds us of victory. From one victory to the next. God begins to do something, begins to give you victory in your life. You begin to see small victories so God can prepare you for that big victory. Well, then, of course, they end up, before they're done, they end up at the River Jordan. And, of course, there's a great uh, miracle that's going to take place here at the River Jordan. Even again, Elijah parts the River Jordan with his mantle. They parted hither and thither. I mean, Elijah just walks up to this thing, whips off his scarf, rolls that thing up and whack, and the river parts. You say, man, that's bound to have been a story that's been passed down and exaggerated. He probably walked across the brook on some rocks or something, and that story got told again and again. I believe in this book, when God says the river Jordan parted hither and thither, then why would God want to record a miracle if all he did is tiptoed across some stones? And why would anybody have been pressed when they saw Elisha do it the power of God is on Elisha. He can tiptoe across stones just as good as Elijah could. No, it was because there was a miracle that took place. Now, Jordan reminds us of the faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So there's a progression that takes place. But you know, I also think about this. He told him several times, Terry here, I pray thee. I'm going to go on to Gilgal. No problem, Elisha. But Elisha said, no, I'm going with you. 
You remember the parable that Jesus gave, Luke 18, 1, men ought, so your parable, men ought always to pray and not to faint. The parable of the unjust judge. Now, Jesus said this. He said a woman went to a judge. The judge didn't fear God. He didn't fear man. So basically, he wasn't impressed. He didn't care if the woman didn't like him. He really didn't care about answering to God. He was totally neutral. But the woman came and said, Judge, avenge me of mine adversary. I'm not going to avenge you of your adversary. I could care less. Your cause is not important to me. I don't care. You're just a widow woman. Doesn't matter to me what anybody thinks, and I'm not worried about answering to God. I'm not doing it. Well, she didn't walk away discouraged. She came back the next day. Judge, it's me again. I want you to avenge me. I'm like, ah, no, I told you yesterday I'm not going to do it. She come back again the third time. After a few times, he said, I'm getting tired of this woman. How many ever said that? No, don't tell me. No, no. Uh, he said, I'm getting tired of this woman. Man, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Now, Jesus used that as an illustration. He says, doesn't sometimes the Father tarry long with us? But now he said, how much more? God's not an unjust judge that doesn't care about me, doesn't care about anything, but he's saying, if that woman could come to a judge on a neutral place, and because she stuck with it, he answered, how much more would the Lord avenge his children? You know, sometimes it seems like he says, trouble me not. Sometimes it seems like he says, tarry here. But the one who says, no, I want to be in the middle of what God's doing. I want to see him answer prayer. I want to see him hold to his word. I want to see God do something. And yes, it may be in the matter of prayer. It may be in the tenacity of just trusting the Lord. But he stuck with Elijah, and he was there when he saw him go up. Now, he stuck with him. He was persistent. But then he gave him a promise. Now, notice the wording here. In verse 9, it came to pass when they were going over, Elijah said, what shall I do for thee? Now, that seems like a reasonable thing. All right, you've stuck with me. You passed the test, Elisha. You're with me now. That's good. So what would you like me to do? Now, again, it's kind of like, uh, I hate to use this illustration, but I think you'll know where I'm going with it. Even as a young child, I mean, I'm not the first person to ever think of this. You thought of it too. I'd watch a little uh, TV show or a cartoon and somebody found a genie with a lamp, right? Or the lamp, you know, you rub it and a genie comes out and he says, I grant you three wishes. Well, the first thing that come to me was, man, I'd use the first two and the third one, I'd say, I wish I had more wishes, right? You just, oh man, I just keep going. That's kind of what Elisha did here. What would you like me to do for you before I go? Well, make me a, you know, a, a wealthy man or uh, even make me a, you know, a, a, a prophet that, that everybody else respects, uh, widen my ministry. I mean, he could ask for anything. He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. I mean, Elijah was already up here. I mean, he wasn't God, but nobody had ever seen a prophet like Elijah. I mean, Elijah was the one who sat up on the mountain and I mean, they came to see him, and he says, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee, and it did. He's the one that called against the prophets of Baal and literally prayed, God, show them that I'm your prophet, and just lightning came out, wiped them all out. I mean, by basically, he said, God, don't let it rain until I pray that it will rain. And I mean, people looked at Elijah and said, if anybody has ever walked with God, and if anybody has ever exercised the power of God on this earth, God uses Elijah. He said, Elijah, I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. But he didn't say, I won't do it. He wasn't going to do it anyway. It was a request. And Elijah didn't give it to him. He said, you've asked a hard thing. But if you see me when I go up, I'll give it to you. A double portion? Elijah performed seven miracles that are recorded in the Old Testament. Remarkable things. You want to just guess without looking how many miracles Elisha performed? Fourteen. A double portion of thy spirit. Now you can ask God some hard things, but is anything too hard for the Lord? Now again, I could ask God some selfish things. He may have to correct me. I can ask God some ignorant things. He may have to inform me. I can ask God some things that are not based on biblical truth. He'll never go against this truth. I'm not saying you can just ask God like a genie on a lap, not by any means. But you get in line with what God wants to do, 
There's nothing he can't do. This is what he meant when he says we may come boldly before him. I mean, to ask God something bold really demonstrates faith, doesn't it? I mean, this is the parable in Luke chapter 11 when a man comes in the middle of the night and he asks for bread. He says, look, I've got a, a neighbor has come on a journey and I have nothing to put before him. Would you give him some bread? The guy's got his you know, hat with a little ball on the side, you know, sticking out the window and his, and his pajamas. And you think he would say, are you nuts? It's midnight. I'm asleep. The guy can wait for breakfast. But instead he said, anybody ask that kind of crazy question? I said, yeah, hang on a minute. Hey, here's a loaf of bread. I mean, again, he's given the illustration because his, his request was so bold the man thought, well, anybody asked something that bold, well, yeah, here you go. I'll give it to you. But he illustrates and says, how much more shall the heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? It's boldness. Why is my boldness? What is it based on? Because I'm such a good person and I do know on the blood of Jesus that I stand complete in. I mean, Elijah said, give me a double portion. He says, you've asked a hard thing. So he gave him the promise and then, of course, the power. In verse 12, Elijah went up into heaven. In verse 12, Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, the horsemen thereof. He saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell down from him and went back and stood by the bank of the river Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? He didn't ask that because he didn't know. His point was, watch what God's going to do. You know those sons of the prophets are watching. They're standing afar off, and they're watching that thing, and they see him go up, and they're already thinking, boy, that's something. He drops that mantle. Elisha takes the mantle, and he walks over to that water. How foolish would he have looked if he'd have walked over there and grabbed that thing, wrapped it up, whack! Ooh, well, that didn't work. Well, he never had any question if it was going to work. And by the way, he wasn't just randomly going out and say, let me just test this thing. This man was walking with God. The Spirit of God wanted him to show those sons of the prophets and be a testimony. Elijah's gone, but God's testimony is not. I've still got a man on this earth. And they knew it. And again, the power of God was evident through his life. I mean, God still works. I remember doing a meeting in uh, Georgia years ago, and this sticks out in my mind because this particular place we went, believe it or not, I hate to even say this name because the church is probably still around, but the name of the church was Corinth Baptist Church. Now, if you know anything about the, the book of Corinthians, that would not be, I don't know if the pastor is just where he was coming from when he named it Corinth Baptist Church. But we got there, and the youth group, of course, were doing exactly what we're doing here in about a month, the war. And I came in with that team, and uh, the youth group met with us on the first day, and they just trashed us. I mean, they just weren't interested. You could tell, cold, indifferent, didn't care what we were there. But we went out in the community and started inviting teenagers to come. Of course, the church was going to provide the facility and the food, but the first night, and this youth group, the church was large. I mean, the youth group had to have 50 kids in it. We came out the first night, rain like cats and dogs. I mean, just poured down raining. None of the kids in the youth group showed up. I think maybe two of them came, and they didn't want to be there. But we had about, oh, 25, 30 kids from the community. But again, we were looking at maybe having 100, 150. We had 30 kids. So we went ahead and had the program in the middle of the rain, brought the kids in, had all kinds of chairs set up, you know, and had these 30 kids sitting up there in the front. But 11 of those kids trusted Jesus that night. I don't care if we had 125 kids there, 11 kids trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And over those next several nights, several, all three nights that it took place was very similar, 25 or 30 kids. Now, were they real? Were they right? Did they really mean it? I don't know. But they walked the aisle for Christ and prayed and asked Jesus to save them. Now, you understand God is not limited in any way except if there's any limitation, he came up with it. And he said he could do there no many mighty works 
because of their unbelief. The people of Israel in the book of Psalms limited the Holy One of Israel. He allowed it, but that was his program because they didn't trust him. Hey, I don't want to be the ignorant crowd, and I don't want to be the indifferent crowd. I want to be the empowered one, and may God give it to us. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. We pray you speak to our heart and challenge us. Lord, we want to see you do wonderful things in our life. We want to see you change people's lives. We want to see the power of God evident. We know that you're able to work. May we not become indifferent to what you do supernaturally. Lead us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 232 is going to